Have you exploited a command injection vulnerability or a path traversal vulnerability in a Python project on Flask? If not, this video is for you. Let's get started. Hello everyone, welcome back to this new episode of the Basilic CTF challenge. We've been able to capture the first flag and then read some source code. From there, we found two potential vulnerabilities. The first one is the path traversal vulnerability in this line. And uh, we were able to retrieve the etc passwd file. In this video, we're going to continue poking around and see if we can get any access to the server. So the first thing I might try here is uh, retrieve some environment variables. This is generally in proc self on Viron. And right away we see that we have language, we have the path, we have the home. This is uh, interesting because I think that the user that we are running the server with is Python. So if I go back to etc passwd, I guess there is some Python here, yes. Okay, let's uh, look for home uh, Python. Yeah, but I think we need a file here. Yep. Here it says, this is a directory, we want a file. Okay, what are the other uh, interesting files that we can take from the web server? So we already know that um, everything is under OPT web server. Okay, we already have access to the source code of Basilic dev website. Hmm, we don't have anything else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, one interesting files we might find on the home directory are bash history, for example. So let's grab that. Home Python dot bash history. Okay, there is nothing here. Maybe I just had a new slash. Yeah, there is no bash history in the user's home directory. Well, that's a bummer. What about bash rc? Yep, so we have bash rc, nothing really interesting here. Generally, any custom commands are added at the end, but that's not the case here. Um, what about dot ssh? And generally, we have authorized keys. Mm, there is nothing there, and if the user has defined a private key, it's generally called IDRSA. We don't have any. Okay, it seems that we are running out of uh, leads. Let's go back to the second vulnerability, exec, and just try to see how we can exploit it. Oh, first of all, I need to have JSON calc as part of the path. So let's do that. And right away we see we have an empty response. I guess that's the response we get in line 25. Okay, so we know that the get parameters are evaluated server side by the Python script. So why don't we use something like u equals one? Hmm, okay. The uh, Python code was evaluated and x was given the value one and u was also given the value one. And the result has been um, returned in a JSON object with the content L, which is these local variables that we've sent. Okay. I wonder if we could do something interesting with that. So if I type two minus one, what should I get? Yep, two minus one got evaluated indeed. What if I do like x equals max, but I need to import the math library. Um, let's go with something really simple like uh, 0, 1, 2, and then take the second element. So that would return 2. Yep, this means that essentially this code has been evaluated server side and the results has been put in our object. So how can we run some code with that? So let's uh, let's actually go and Google some Python jail escape. 
So what do we have here? Built-ins contains a list of uh, objects. Oh, I see why they have gone ahead and emptied the uh, built-in objects, as you can see here, for security. Okay, so this is essentially based on the built-in object. We don't have that, so this is not useful. What about this one? How to Python jail escape, new BCTF, okay. So this one is also using the built-ins, not useful. Python sandbox escape. And really, if you sit next to a hacker, much of their time is just uh, trying to overcome hurdles, unless you're facing a really simple challenge. So this is all part of the game. So what do we have here? sys.modules, mm -hmm. sec file, built-ins, what else? Oh yeah, this is what I think I've been looking for. So we're defining a string and then we take in the name of the class. Uh, let, let, let's take this one and put it in here. Type tuple is not JSON serializable. We don't care, this is an error, but what's interesting here is that we've got the name of the class, tuple, which means that we can do something like dot, oops, dot and then uh, base, base or bases, not sure. Yeah, type object. So we've got the base uh, object from which this um, tuple, I guess, inherits from. And then what we can say here, yeah, so we are going to target all subclasses. So here I'm calling all the subclasses, but I'm getting an error, so I, I don't get a list. So why don't we like go one by one? If I type three, we land on weak proxy class. And here in the uh, blog, they are talking about a specific class called, which has the index 40, which is uh, nothing but, let's see. So in my Python terminal, I'm going to just type help and then that long string. And we land on the file class. So this would essentially allow us to read files. So let's try that. So that would be 40. And if we hit enter, indeed, this is the file class. All right, we are progressing here. Okay, we're going to initiate maybe a file with the right permissions and write one, two, three, just to, as a proof of concept. If everything goes well, we should have content123 into a file in the web root called input. But I, I think I need to update that. OPT web server. And let's call it proof of concept.txt. Why not? Hit enter. Saying in invalid syntax. I'm not sure why. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna use burp just to inspect and play with the traffic much easier. So we have invalid syntax. I guess it's because we have these bunch of uh, quotes which was which were URL encoded. So I'm going to send this to the repeater and uh, just um, take this part right here and URL decode it. I'm also going to remove any spaces because that would introduce some errors. And let's send it. Okay, so we, now we get a different response. File constructor not accessible in restricted mode. Yeah, Ilahi. In addition to the jail escape, we need to also bypass the restricted mode or like use a class which is not, which is not inspected by that. So any ideas? The first thing that comes to my mind is use the intruder and iterate through all the classes. So that would be this one here. Going to add a placeholder. 
And I'm just going to remove anything after that and probably just use an empty um, constructor. So this part here would evaluate to a class and then we would instantiate it using these, uh, these parentheses. Let's go to payloads and choose the payload numbers. And we want to go from one or let's say from zero to 500, maybe a thousand. And we don't want any fractions. And in the settings, I want to extract the name of the class. So where it is, grep extract, click on add. And we want this part right here. Something that is right after editor, but also before constructor. Okay, everything looks fine. Let's start the attack and see what we get. Hmm, invalid number setting. What do we have here? We want numbers. Ah, I want to step to be one. Let's start the attack. And as you can see in this dedicated column, we have all the extracted headers. But these are like headers, yes, but we are most in, mostly interested in the names of the classes that we can play with in order to achieve something interesting. So this is essentially a information disclosure vulnerability. Agreed, it's just uh, returning the stack trace or the error, but sometimes errors can be revealing, like the case here. So let's uh, order them. So what do we have here? Zip importer, X range, type T. It took me some time to find the right one. You know what? I think I'm gonna repeat that attack but without actually calling the constructor. First of all, I just want to know what are the different class names. Yeah, and I need to adjust my grep extract as well because here I'm getting a lot of strings. So in the settings, go to that and edit it. And I want to refetch the response and target between quotes like that and start the attack. Okay. C'est bon maintenant. We have the names of all the classes that we could uh, enumerate. You can recognize the file which has ID 40. Here it is, catch warnings. So remember its ID is 59. Why is this class important? Because it allows us to run. It has um, interesting attributes such as the built-ins. Also it has a module that loads OS. If this seems Chinese to you, let me just import OS. So OS is what allows us to run system commands. So here I'm running operating system commands from Python through the OS module. Um, there is also the uh, sub process and sub process has also another interesting method called popen which takes in a list. For example, I can say um, ls and then comma and then the second element would be the argument and etc. So let's give it a path, for example, clash temp. And fortunately for us, this class supports those. So we can do 59 here and then we will play with this. So this class if we try to instantiate it, it says here catch warnings is not JSON. JSON serializable doesn't matter. So now that we have the class, we could say, hey, give me all your uh, elements or attributes. So this is basically a dictionary and we want its keys. So in these, um, this class has, or this constructor, has three elements, module, record, and entered. And really, if we Google uh, this class, as you can see here, we have the record module that we can find here as well. So I'm interested in the module. It says that in the documentation that I can run any module. The module argument takes a module that will be used instead of the module returned 
when you import warnings. So essentially we can uh, call any other module. So let's uh, see what this module has. Again, we are going to use the dictionary dot keys. Uh, actually, I need to take that. So these are the keys that we have. And one of them is line cache. Line cache is important because it has OS module already imported. So if we type OS dot, let's say system and then run ID, hopefully we should get something back. OS object has no attribute line cache. Oh yeah, because we need to remove this dict keys. We just use that to enumerate the attributes. And voila, we have zero, which means that this was successful. Now, if I type in read to read the results, mm, nope, not read operating system dot. Let's use, uh, actually, let's use the uh, p open function and read and voila, we were able to run remote code from the Python context by loading the module line cache, which in turn loads the module OS, essentially jailbreaking the web application. Perfect. So in the next video, we're going to see how we can leverage this to finally get a reverse shell. If you learned something from this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. It helps me grow it. Don't forget to hit that ring bell so that upcoming videos reach you as soon as they are live. As always, stay curious, keep learning and go find some bugs.